All right, folks, we are finishing up our Atlantic revolutions. We've covered the American Revolution. We've covered the French Revolution. We've covered the Haitian Revolution. And now, for some reason, the College Board puts all Latin American revolutions lumped into one. I don't know why they're doing that. I don't really approve of it, but whatever, that's how they do it. Okay, so if you remember, in North America, the rich white people there had a problem with Great Britain suddenly putting all these rules and laws and taxes on them, and that made them really mad and suddenly led to a revolution. Well, it was similar like that in Latin America, except it took a lot longer. And a big reason for that was because Latin America was, let me back up for a second. Amer North America, those colonies had been mostly left free not really free, but autonomous, mostly, you know, Great Britain really didn't care anything about them, thought they were all losers and didn't really bother with them. And so they mostly got to just do whatever they wanted. Well, Spain and Portugal were not like that with their colonies in Latin America. They were strictly, they were strict authoritarians with them and were really, really strict with them. And so when they started being even more strict and giving more taxes and more tariffs and more laws towards Latin America, sure, the Creoles didn't like it. And there were some hints of rebellion against it. It didn't, the rebellion didn't really take off as strongly as it did in North America, because in North America, they had had a lot more freedoms for a very long time. And in Latin America, they had always been led with a harsh hand, very, very strictly. So, but now they were, they had been, these Latin Americans, they were inspired by the Enlightenment and they had these great ideas of leading themselves and democracy. So the Creoles, and once again, please let me, I hope I don't have to remind you who the Creoles are, but I'm going to anyway. We had the Peninsulares, and then the Creoles, and then we had the Mestizos, and then the Mulattoes, and then the Indios, and then the, uh, I called them the Africans in the beginning of the year, but in the book now, they suddenly call them the Negros. And those are the classes of the system that was called the Casta system. Those were the social class systems. And the, the Peninsulares were the Europeans born on the Iberian Peninsula, that's Spain and Portugal, that happens to live in Latin America. And the Creoles were their children, were people of European descent, but they were born in Latin America. So they were elites, they were wealthy, but they were actually born there. Well, they were the ones that were kind of feeling a little rebellious. They were feeling some rebellion was coming over them. 
Another reason why they would have some issues with rebellion that was different than North America was white people were vastly outnumbered. White people, people that looked like me, there were far fewer of them than you had. Native indigenous peoples, you had many more indigenous peoples, mixed race peoples, people of African descent, you had lots more of them. So there was a power structure issue that you had to, that was constantly something that had to be worried about. Now we got to go back to Napoleon. Napoleon is someone you always have to think about during this time period. Late 1700s, early 1800s, Napoleon was a major player in world geopolitics. Napoleon has taken over France and his coup. He's now uh, called him, he's saying that he's ruling a French empire. He's conquering other lands. He has invaded both Spain and Portugal. When he invades Portugal, the royal family, the king, queen, and their son, the prince, flee, they leave Portugal, they go across the Atlantic Ocean to Brazil, their colony. And when they get there, the people of Brazil, the colonists, the Creoles there, that was just one step too much for them. They were like, oh, uh, 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 uh. we ain't having this. Like, we can handle the taxes. We can handle the tariffs. We can handle the new laws. But the freaking king coming to live right here in our colony? Mm, no. So that was a big instigation of rebellion. And that kind of, I can't say, I do not want you to think that that was the one major trigger. It's not that there was one major thing that triggered rebellions all across Latin America. There were a million things. There were a million little things that happened that caused this rebellion. But it was a pretty big thing, Napoleon invading Spain and Portugal, the king, queen, and their son fleeing, going across the Atlantic Ocean and taking up residency in Brazil. That, it was a big one. That really brought up a real feeling of rebellion in the people and a wave of revolutions shortly began all across Latin America after that. So the first one that we really saw happen was in Mexico. And so the Creoles, we're talking about the rich white people. The rich white people wanted to rebel against Spain, but there was a problem. Think about France. Do you remember how in France, we had a real class war. Their rebellion was class war. It was the poor fighting against the rich. And then think about Haiti. And you had four different classes. And the Grand Blancs, were wanting to fight against France, trying to put more laws on them. 
the free people of color wanted equal rights. The Petit Blanc were jealous of the free people of color. And then the slaves, you know, they didn't want to be slaves anymore. Everybody had a reason to fight. Well, in Mexico, the Creoles wanted freedom from Spain because they thought Spain was oppressing them. They were this, they were colonizing imperial, imperialist and they wanted to be their own independent Spain and they wanted to be able to oppress the, the people. They wanted to be the ones oppressing the poor. They didn't think that Spain should be oppressing the poor. They wanted to oppress the poor. Well, the poor of Mexico wanted to, you know, not be poor anymore. They, they wanted to be able to buy food for their children, put clothes on their back. I mean, they, they wanted to have a decent life like we all want. And so different classes were rebelling for different reasons. So the Creoles rebelled against Spain, but while the Creoles were rebelling against Spain, the poor, the peasant class rebelled against the Creoles. And the peasants that rebelled against the Creoles were inspired by two Catholic priests, two Catholic priests that uh, used this thing called liberation theology. Liberation theology, which was a Catholic theology that was all about helping the poor. And their names were Miguel Hidalgo. Hidalgo is H-I-D-A-L-G-O. Hidalgo, Miguel Hidalgo, and Jose Morelos, M-O-R-E-L-O-S, M-O-R-L, uh, so sorry, M-O-R-E-L-O-S. So Miguel Hidalgo and Jose Morelos were two Catholic priests that inspired a revolution, a peasant revolution. This was called the, uh, yeah, it was the peasant rebellion of Mexico. And the actual college board doesn't, like your AP book doesn't go too much into uh, the Mexican rebellion, the Mexican revolution, but I think it's important and you should learn about it. And in my other world history class, we go into a lot of detail about it. So later I'm going to post my already pre-recorded lecture that I made for my other class about the Mexican revolution. I'm not gonna talk about it a whole lot right here because it would just be a waste of honestly, my time, because I've already done it before in a different lecture. So I'm just going to find it and I'm going to post it here later. Uh, so, um, uh, sorry. Anyway, the peasants rose up and rebelled against the Creoles. But sadly, the Creoles teamed together with the Catholic Church, the church with a capital C, like the church, and the main, main, main Catholic Church didn't actually support these two, these two priests. They considered the two priests rebels, and the Creoles, with the church's financial support, raised an army and they defeated the peasants, which is very sad. So now the Creoles are in control again. 
And then uh, at that same time, the Creoles are fighting the Spanish and the Creoles fought off the Spanish and won independence. Yay! So there's uh, Spanish, uh, I mean, not Spanish, Mexican independence. Mexico is now the Republic of Mexico. And um, let's see, what was, sorry, I'm checking my notes. Um, it's really important, really important to remember that throughout Latin America, these revolts were always like, the rich white people were revolting against their European uh, colonizers who they felt were oppressing them. But the indigenous peoples and the, uh, all the classes below them, like the Africans that had been brought in as slaves, all the poor people, they were revolting against the Creoles. And in Peru, there was a big revolt led by um, Tupac Amaru in the 1780s. That's a big uh, rebellion to know about. Because all these rebellions were happening, the, the poor people against the rich people, this guy, Simon Bolivar, Bolivar, B-O-L-I-V-A-R, B-O-L-I-V-A-R, Simon Bolivar. He was this guy that wanted so fiercely, fiercely, wanted an independent Latin America, and he wanted to unify Latin America as like one nation. He wanted like, uh, instead of the United States of America, he wanted the United States of Latin America. And uh, he didn't think that was ever going to happen with all the different classes always fighting each other, you know, with the mestizos and the indios and the, uh, the Africans and the Creoles always fighting each other. And so Bolivar came up with this great idea. It was like a, a nationalist idea, nationalism, to convince the people that they were one, to convince all people born in Latin America, that they were one people. They were Americanos, um, like Americanos, A-N-E-R-I-C-A-N-O-S, Americanos. He said, there is no Creole, there is no Indio, there is no Mestizo, there is no Mulatto, there is no Negro, there is only Americano. If you were born in Latin America, you are a Americano to unite the people as one and make them all fight as one army, make them fight as one person against the Spaniards. And it worked, it worked. And almost all the colonies in South America won their independence against their imperialist colonizers. Yay! Well, um, yay for the Creoles. It didn't really work out so well for all the other classes. The Creoles kept the social classes the exact same. All the poor people stayed poor and life sucked for them. Life stayed awful. Poor people stayed poor. Nothing changed. Rich people stayed rich, poor people stayed poor. It sucked. 
Bolivar just used them as a tool. He was like, we're all one people. Yay, let's be in an army together. We're Americanos. And, but nothing changed for them. And uh, let's see. Same recurring theme in world history. Nothing changed for women. Even though women all across Latin America joined with men and fought in this liberating war, lots of women wore men's clothing like Joan of Arc did. Women uh, dressed up like men and fought in the war. Women did all kinds of things to help the independence fight. But when they got, once they got independence, oh, and men were happy to take that help. But once the fight was over, women just went right back to being property of the men of the home and having to do whatever the man says. You know, that's just how it went forever. And uh, Simon Bolivar's dream of a uh, United States of Latin America he wanted that all the way to his death in 1830. Never happened because the people of these Latin American areas could never get, get along with each other. They just bickered and fought and argued all the time. They couldn't decide how to rule their countries together. Everybody argued with each other all the time. And they just couldn't, they couldn't be united. And let's see. So um, before the revolutions, prior to the North American revolutions and prior to the South American revolutions, the power dynamics of like North America was considered like the people were considered like losers. They were all dumb and poor and Great Britain and Europe didn't care anything about them and they were worthless colonies. But South America was wealthy and thriving and educated. People compared many cities in South America to Paris, Paris. South America was so fancy and nice and luxurious and people dreamed of going to South America. It was so nice. But then after the revolution, this dynamic, switched and North America kind of suddenly became industrialized, wealthy, democratic, and this like structured, rich, well-respected place. And South America, Latin America fell into like disrepair, they like the nations became impoverished, like poor, broke. Uh, many of them were not democratic at all. Authoritarian strongman leaders would take control and try to lead one and then another country and their, their governments were always in disarray. Uh, they were so poor that they couldn't really even afford to support their own countries. And so they would have to borrow money from other countries just to keep their own country running. And it was just, everything was unstable and poor. So it was like this weird flip of South America and North America, pre-revolution and post-revolution. That is all I got on the Latin American revolutions for world history class. I hope you guys are doing great. 
and I will see you all soon.